Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Father, we pray your blessing now upon the Word of God. We ask in Jesus' precious name, and amen. Amen. Here we left off last time here about Solomon saying here in the last chapter, Ecclesiastes 12, 1, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Uh, remember your creator lest you forget him. And uh, why do we tend to forget about our creator? Number one, uh, refusing to listen to the Lord or not paying attention to him. We went over that last time. And then uh, riches that ruin people or no reliance upon the Lord. We went over that. Uh, in 1863, President Lincoln designated April 30th as a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And here's a portion of his proclamation on that occasion. President Lincoln said, this 1863, this is 160 years ago. Quote, it is the duty of nations as well as of men who owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by a history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. <clears throat> he said, <coughs> excuse me, the awful calamity of civil war which now desolates the land may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has grown but we have forgotten God. Unquote. That's what Abraham Lincoln said 160 years ago. If we, if this nation forgot God 160 years ago, how do you think it is now? I, I think everybody in the, uh, all of our leaders, regardless of what party they are, they ought to read that right there. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And uh, so the third reason why we forget God is replacing or substituting God with other things. We went over that. Number four, rejecting the word of God and embracing that which is evil. Number five, reckoning God as unimportant or precious in our lives. And uh, I went over that in some detail. Uh, Freddie, Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of the rock group Queen, used to have all their eight tracks in the 70s. Sad to say I did. Uh, Freddie Mercury died of AIDS at the end of 1991. He wrote one of his last songs on the Miracle album. Does anybody know what we are living for? I know what I'm living for. I'm living for Jesus. Amen. 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 <clears throat> his sentiments sum up the feelings and questions that many people have today. Thank God for Jesus Christ who gives all believers a purpose for living. And that purpose is to glorify God. He, can get, he gives everybody a purpose that they'll get saved and serve him. And then going on today, uh, number six, people forget God because there's no review or practice or reminder of the truth of God's word. There's no reminder of the truth of God's word. Second Peter 1.12, Peter said, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Really, that's what preaching and teaching is. It's, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> It's putting you in remembrance of things that really we basically heard for many, many years. There's no new thing. I mean, you know, basically all the preaching and teaching that preachers preach, uh, myself and Brother Gary, Brother Frank, 
and uh, other preachers that uh, preach and teach and come in here and so forth were basically saying the same thing. We might take a different text, but basically when it comes down to it, we're saying get saved and serve God. That's basically when it comes down to it. That's what we're saying. And uh, might be different outlines, different illustrations, and that type of thing. When we fail to review or put into practice the truth of God's word, we tend to forget them. When we are not reminded of God's truth or put ourselves in a situation where we can't be reminded, like skipping church or not serving God, then we tend to forget. <clears throat> Number seven, the rigors and distraction of everyday living. Jesus said in Mark 4.19, And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. That's a saved person in Mark 4.19. That's not an unsaved person. That's a saved person. But what happens? The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Riches are deceitful. People go after them and then some attain them or get them and then they realize this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And they're empty. They're void. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word a lot of Christians, uh, the, the word's been choked in their lives. Choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Becometh, implying at one time it was fruitful, but it becometh unfruitful. It doesn't say it never was fruitful. It says becometh unfruitful. And that's true of a lot of, a lot of saved people. And so we ought to pray for these people this year, 2023. You ought to pray for your family, your friends, your relatives, your neighbors. People that are not saved, obviously they'll get saved. But if they are saved, they're not in church. Invite them out to church. And... Uh, Tell them, you know, they need to have a testimony of being faithful to God and the things of God and so forth. The word cares in Mark 4, 19, the cares of this world, means care or anxiety. Uh, it means to divide, to separate into parts or cut into pieces. Satan endeavors to distract us by causing division between us and the Lord. He tries to cut up our lives into pieces. Chop, chop, chop. He's good at it, too. He's had 6,000 years to deal with humanity. 6,000 years since Adam and Eve. 6,000 years of dealing with flesh and blood. Many believers, unfortunately, believe that they think, I have my life at church and I have a different life at school or home or work. These believers live one way at home and another way at church. It doesn't work that way. We're to be consistent Christ-like wherever we are. Our testimony is not to be cut up into pieces depending where we are at you know, the time. We're not to live our lives as our Christians uh, with uh, our finger in the air trying to find out which way the winds of the crowd are blowing. If you're going to put your finger in the air, then point to heaven and say, Lord, I'm living for you no, ma no matter what others may say or do. This is what a dedicated ambassador for Christ will do. We are ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, Paul said. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Uh, because the groom was an amateur golf champion, I don't know if I can pronounce this guy's last name, Mr. Asimakopoulos decided to use a golf illustration complete with a golf ball, in his wedding meditation. He recruited the best man to bring a golf ball and hand it to him at the appropriate time in the wedding ceremony. The following day, as the processional began, he asked the best man if he had remembered the ball. Smiling, he reached into his pocket. Then his expression suddenly changed. Yes, he'd remembered the golf ball, but he forgot to bring the bride's ring. <laughs> that's a picture of a lot of Christian people in America so what do you mean preacher the golf ball distracted him from his most important responsibility bring the bride's ring I mean bring the golf ball but most importantly you have to get your priorities right there, uh, Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said uh Duties never conflict. In other words, there is in other words, there's some something that you maybe could have done tonight at six o'clock. 
I mean, and it might have been halfway important, maybe a little bit important or very important, but it can wait till 7.30, 8 o'clock, whatever. You see, it can wait till after this service is over and you get home. In other words, duties never conflict. Tomorrow when you get up, there's, some, there's something you've got to do tomorrow morning that's more important than anything else. Those other things are going to have to wait because you've got to do whatever it is, the most important thing, right now at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., whatever time it is, 1 or 2 in the afternoon. Duties never conflict. What is it when you've got 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 things that are due at a certain time of morning, afternoon, or evening, you say, what is the most important thing right now that I need to do? The golf ball distracted him from his most important responsibility. We too forget what God wants us to do because we get distracted by the cares of this life. The cares of this life. <clears throat> the November 2010 issue of Christianity Today reports that among young adults in the United States, this is 12, 13 years ago, sociologists are seeing a major shift taking place away from Christianity. Recent studies have brought the trend to light. Among the findings released in 2009 from the American Religious Identification Survey, ARIS, one stood out. The percentage of Americans claiming no religion, no religion, almost doubled in about two decades, 20 years, climbing from 8.1% in 1990 to 15% in 2008. The trend wasn't confined to one region. Those marking no religion, called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, nuns, no religion, none, made up the only group to have grown in every state, from the secular Northeast to the conservative Bible Belt. The nuns were, not Catholic nuns, but N-O-N-E-S, the nuns, the no religion. The nuns were most numerous among the young. Listen to this. A whopping 22% of 18 to 29-year-olds claim no religion, up from 11% in 1990. I'm not trying to be mean or anything because I'm talking about my wife and I are some of our children too. My wife and I got talking the other day and I said, what's going on? What is the deal with 18 to 40 year olds today? They don't want God, honey. Right. You ever stop to think about it? I could list right now off the top of my little pea brain. If I sat down and really thought about it and wrote it down, it would be a bunch more. I could sit and tell you right now the number of Christian men and women whose one or more of their children or all their children or some of their children are either A, not saved, or B, they are saved, but are not in church, not serving the Lord, and don't seem to really care that much about serving the Lord. Am I telling it right? Yeah. I'm not being mean. I'm saying, you say, yeah, preacher, I know. that I feel like a failure. Don't feel like a failure. If you raise your kid, my wife and I had our kids in church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, Sunday morning. We was down in eight years down in Georgia, where the Homer Smith had a pastor school and a missionary candidate in, in January, and a missionary candidate school in June, and he had preachers from all over the country in there preaching. He had morning services, afternoon services, and evening services, and me and my wife and our kids were at every single Single service. You say sitting in the pew, didn't your backside get kind of sore about about Wednesday, about Thursday? It sure did, honey. Hear about thirty-five messages for the week. I 
I don't know what it is. I know, I know preachers and preachers' wives, Christian men and women, that had their that love God, love the Bible, love church, love the spiritual things of God. And one or more of their kids don't have a spiritual bone in their entire carcass. Explain it. I can't explain it. I'm reading some things right here, some statistics about it. It's nationwide, honey. It's part of the falling away. But you and I don't have to fall away. You say it's discouraging, though, preacher, to see children and grandchildren don't, not want to serve God and go the opposite way, the, the way they were brought up. I know it is. You've got to keep on serving God. The study also found that 73% of nuns, no religion, came from religious homes. 66% were described by the study as de-converts. D-E, converts. Other survey results have been grimmer. At the May 2009 Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, top political scientists Robert Putnam and David Campbell presented research from their book American Grace. They reported that young Americans are dropping out of religion at an alarming rate of five to six times the historic rate 30 to 40 percent have no religion today versus 5 to 10 percent a generation ago. What's happening? Well, not only because of the sin and wickedness and perversion in our nation, but our nation is distracted by things and focused on that which cannot satisfy them. The quest for wealth has distracted their hearts from seeking God or serving Him, and some aren't necessarily going after wealth trying to get rich or anything. They just aren't interested in the things of God. And my wife and I know some people that have gone through some real trials in their life. And you think, that'll get them saved or that'll get them right with God. They'll rededicate their life on that one, buddy. Well, God rang their bell on that one, buddy. God, get... They just shake their fist at God and they just keep right on going. Did you know in the tribulation, we went over this in our verse-by-verse -verse study in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Two or three times in Revelation, it says there, and they repented not. And they repented not. As we move closer, the world moves closer to the rapture and then the tribulation. We're moving closer to it. As we move closer to the tribulation, of course the church is going to be raptured, but we still got to get closer to it. People are going to hear sermons and messages. There are people in this country that have heard hundreds and hundreds of messages, sermons on salvation, and still aren't saved. There are thousands and millions of Christians in this country that have heard messages about getting right with God and rededicating your life to the Lord and getting on fire for God and serving God and selling out lock, stock, and barrel over and over and over and over again like water off a duck's back. Still haven't gotten right with God. That heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. God said, who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, he said. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10. When people forget the Lord in their lives, they develop some very negative traits and reap serious consequences. There's a price to pay when you ignore the Lord in your heart and life and you forget about God. The very one that's giving us the very breath that we are drawing. The only reason why you're living right now is because of God. Yeah. You realize that? Amen. You do realize that. Amen. The only reason why you're breathing right now, why I'm breathing, is because of God. Paul said, for in him we live and move and have our being. Acts 17.28. Jesus said one time, imagine a man walking on this earth 2,000 years ago. You know what he said one time in John 15, 5? He said, for without me, you can do nothing. You think he wasn't God? He was God. Now, the consequences of forgetting God. Number one, one of the consequences of forgetting God is bitter tears. 
bitter tears. Jeremiah 3.21 A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Ignoring God is not going to make you happy. And it's not going to make your children happy and your grandchildren and your friends and your relatives and your neighbors and people you work with or go to school with. Do you realize we serve a God that is able to look down on this world? I mean, you know the Bible says the nations are a drop of the, a drop in a bucket there back in the Old Testament Psalms and Proverbs. Do you realize that God deals in nations? God's able to look down in the world and see everybody at one time. Now you think about a God like that. I mean, I, my vision is limited. I mean, if I look on this side of the sanctuary, I can't really see what's going on over here. I Maybe, mean, you know, a little bit out of the corner of my eye or something. But I mean, I'm limited in my vision. I can't even see this whole sanctuary. God can look on down. They say there's 8 billion people now on the earth. As of November the 15th, the Census Bureau said there's 8 billion people on the earth now. God knows every one of them. He knows their name. He knows their address. He knows their social security number. He knows who their grandma and grandpa is and who all their cousins and nephews and nieces are. That's the kind of God we serve. Yeah. The consequence of forgetting God, bitter tears. Remember, don't forget God this year. Make 2023 the best year, the best Christian uh, year of your Christian life you possibly can. Because it might be, we might be raptured out of here this year. You never know. Amen. Yeah. Number two, consequence of forgetting God, bitter tears, and the burden of your sinful choices. Ezekiel 23, 35. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast forgotten me and cast me behind thy back, therefore hear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. Therefore bear thou, bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. There are consequences to sinful living and ignoring God. We can find forgiveness when we ask God for it. We may still feel the scars of our sins for many years. I, as I've mentioned many times, I can get a hammer and a nail and I can pound the nail into this pulpit right here. All right? That's, that's a picture of sin. And I can pull the nail out of this wood. That's a picture of God's forgiveness. But it leaves a mark. Still leaves a mark. You say, yeah, but God forgave me. I know, but it still leaves a mark. Sin always leaves a mark. Yeah. Young people, the sin always leaves marks on your life. Sin never leaves a person any better than when it found him. Sin never leaves a person any better than when it found him. In other words, you're never better off by sinning. Your flesh might enjoy that sin, but you're not better off. Uh, number three, the consequence, the consequence of forgetting God. The barrenness of and blunders and the loss of blessing. Barrenness. Isaiah 17, verse 10 and 11. Calls thou, because calls, thou hast forgotten the, Lord, the God of thy salvation and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants and shalt set it with strange slips. In the day thou shalt make thy plant to grow, and in the morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. Ignoring God leads to failure, dissatisfaction, and emptiness. You know why there's so many empty people? You know why so many people's lives that you hear about on TV and radio and the newspapers and in society and on Facebook, on your phone that you look at 12 hours a day? You want to know why there's so much turmoil and discontent? Because people have said, See you later, alligator, to God. That's what they say to God. Barrenness, blunders, and the loss of blessing. Number four, what the consequence of forgetting God. Number four, bondage from sinful decisions. 
1 Samuel 12, 9. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, and in the hand of the Philistines, and in the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. When people forget about God, they tend to live in sin, and many become enslaved to sinful habits. You know what God does? Don't nobody get mad. I'm just telling it like it is, okay? You know what God does to a nation that has spit in his face now for 60 years we have? You know when the Beatles came over in the 1960s? And Ed Sullivan brought them over? Had them on his program in the 60s? 64, I think it was. And then, uh, and then Madeline Murray O'Hare started working and got the prayer out of the schools in the 60s. 60s 50s, really, the rock and roll Elvis and all that stuff started happening. But 60s is when it really got going. And then the homosexual movement came out in the 70s. And it got gone big time. And abortion. All these sins, these moral, social sins and different things. You know what God does to a nation? He just lets people get into office that are going to do things that are going to hurt and bring, and bring policies out that are going to hurt the American people. That's part of his judgment. You can get mad all you want about it. And I have. God says, ah, $1.79 two and a half years ago, gas $1.79. I think I'm going to get some folks in there and we'll, we'll raise that thing up to 4 or $5 a gallon. <laughs> Groceries decent price. I think we're going to get some folks in there so the groceries will be out the nose, high. Clothes. we we'll buy clothes and shoes and tires for your car and everything you try to buy is sky high! You say, what is that? that did that just accidentally happen? No. That's what God does to a nation that has spit in his face for 60 years. That's what God does to a nation whose Supreme Court says that homosexuality and lesbian, homosexual and lesbian marriages are lawful now. He burned Sodom and Gomorrah to the ash, into ashes. Remember those yeah. sins? <coughs> you know, archaeologists have tried for years to find even a little bit of ashes or a little bit of evidence and a little bit of... They can't find of Sodom and Gomorrah. God burned them cities to ashes. He rained fire and brimstone. As I've said many times, let me go to my notes in Genesis, and we went over this in our verse by verse study in Genesis. Uh, he rained fire and brimstone out of heaven. Uh, fire and brimstone. Let's do a little thing here on fire and brimstone if we may. Uh, brimstone is the word in the New Testament for sulfur. And uh, for sulfur and second here. Uh, brimstone is the word in the New Testament for sulfur and normally that stuff is found underground. In a chemistry lab, when you run a Bunsen burner in the daytime, you're supposed to hang a sign on it. That's a sign that's on that it's, that the Bunsen burner is on in the daytime. Because when uh, when you light that burner, you can't see it in the daytime. And that, that, what's that prove? That means that the lake of fire, people say, how could it be a lake of fire but everlasting darkness? Easy, honey. That means the lake of fire can be outer darkness with fire and still have no light. And God says it. It's true. Yeah. Even if our little brains can't figure it out, I'll say it again. 
Genesis 19, 24, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. That supernatural fire out of heaven. That's found in hell. According to four verses in Revelation. Brimstone. That's what God thinks of that sin. It's out of hell. Brimstone is the word in the New Testament for sulfur, and normally that stuff is found underground. But he rained this out of heaven. You think God can't do anything, honey? In a chemistry lab, when you run a Bunsen burner in the daytime, you're supposed to hang a sign on it that it's on. Because people can't... When you light that burner, that sulfide flame... You can't see it in the daytime, and that means the lake of fire can be outer darkness with fire and still have no light. Because I've heard people say, well, how can hell be eternal darkness and, but, but that has fire? Fire lights up, so it can't be. Some little pea brains. People that think they're smarter than God. You think I'm going to try to fight God? No way. No way. Uh, so, uh, then, then there's uh, bondage from sinful decisions. 1 Samuel 12, 9. Then number five, bitterness and a brick-like heart. Bitterness and a brick-like... You ever seen so many people that seem so hard-hearted about the things of God? Oh, preacher, this is this is hard preaching. This is easy preaching. <coughs> this ain't hard preaching. This is Bible preaching. Amen. Bitterness and a brick-like heart. Defying God will make you hateful and hard-hearted. You ever seen so many hateful and hard-hearted people in your life? I've noticed it. I got saved in the 70s and started going out knocking on doors. In the 70s and 80s. 70s and 80s. I tell you, in the early 90s, you go knocking on doors, and man, people invite you into their home. Come on in. What church are you from, brother? Uh, we go down here, what else? It's a Baptist church. Oh, okay. Well, we go down here to the church and so forth. You want a cup of coffee? Want something to drink? Uh, that's all right. We got to get going here, but appreciate that. Buddy, you're lucky today if they even answer the door. Kill me. And there's eight cars in the driveway. And there's a blaring stereo going on inside the house. That's probably why they can't hear the door. But And when they answer the door, a lot of times, they got like a brick-hearted attitude. Paul said in Philippians 3, I tell you... I tell you, uh, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Also, I'll tell you, even weeping. You want to know why Paul wept when he, he seen people that rejected God? Because Paul had an experience on the road to Damascus that he never forgot. God struck him down on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, this voice out of heaven is God speaking personally to Paul. That's why I wrote half the New Testament. Why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The pricks of conscience were stabbed with Paul. Because two chapters earlier, in chapter 7 of Acts, he sees Stephen get his brains bashed out, stoned out. The witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, who later became Paul. Paul witnessed Stephen's murder. You think that didn't have an impression upon him? Stephen might get some crowns and reward. I mean, there might be some other people too involved in Paul's conversion. But Stephen, I guarantee you was, had a big part of it. Yeah. He got killed. And Paul witnessed Stephen's death. Got stoned to death. About two chapters later, Paul gets struck down on the road to Damascus. And the Lord says to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He was persecuting God's people, having them being put to death. 
He said, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That's the pricks of conscience stabbing old Paul. Ever since he saw that bloody massacre at Stephen. Stephen says, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge. Could you say that if you get stunned to death? Hmm. Them people had God all over them, inside of them, all over them. Paul knew. He knew that if a person died without Christ, they're going to burn hell forever. Just as simple as that. He said, I tell you, Philippians 3, 18 and 19, he said, I tell you, even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. That's what he said in Philippians 3. I believe it's verse 18 and 19. Who mind earthly things, he said. They just, they just love the earthly things instead of God. Now, there's nothing wrong with having earthly things. Nothing wrong with being blessed with some material things. But the problem with most people is they can't keep God first. People say, I wish I could win a million dollars. A million dollars would ruin 95% of the people in this country. Amen. They wouldn't know what to do with it. And you know what they would do with it? They would splurge and waste it. And within a year or two or three, they probably wouldn't have a dime to their name. And you ask them, what would you do with that million? Well, what do you got to show for it? Uh, nothing. Bitterness and a brick-like heart. Defying God will make you hateful and hard-hearted. Such attitudes never seem to fail to make a person caustic because to adopt such attitudes indicates an ungrateful heart. And there's several verses that uh, talk about that. And then number six, boastfulness or pride. Ignoring God indicates you've got a pride problem. To think you do not need, need him exposes your foolishness. Deuteronomy 8, verses 13 and 14, And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget God. That's Deuteronomy 8, verse 13 and 14. In spite of forget, forgetfulness of his oppressors, the psalmist found peace in God's word. Psalms 119, 140. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Love the word of God. Love the things of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Colossians 3, 2. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart yeah. be also. Matthew 6, 19-21. If I've never met a person, I can talk to them in the first 20-25 minutes, I know where their heart is. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34. You know what's in a person's heart by what they say, what they're talking The psalmist says that God's word is very pure, exceedingly. Number seven, the, uh, we forget God because of the burden of eternal death. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. If a person rejects Christ as Savior, that person will spend eternity in hell. Psalms 9, 17. I've said it many times, you're probably tired of me saying it. Spurgeon preached a message in the 1800s at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England, to thousands of people there. And he preached a message on the hell of hell. He said the hell of hell is the fact that it's forever. You never get out. So the Roman Catholic Church has developed this thing in the last 15 centuries that there's purgatory and you, you give money to the Catholic Church. And the more money you give, the, the, they pray your loved ones out of purgatory and they go to a higher place on it. That's kind of borderlining on Mormonism. Mormonism. Mormons believe some of that stuff type thing. Levels of that type of thing in heaven. Now there's different rewards in heaven at the judgment seat. But there's not all that other stuff. The best way to avoid forgetting the Lord is to stay close to Him. That's what living in the shadows is all about. Because a shadow indicates closeness. 
A shadow is not far from the object that is casting the shadow. There are dire consequences in forgetting God. Here in Ecclesiastes 12.1, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Uh, and it goes on. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light, verse 2, or the moon or the stars be not darkened, or the clouds return after the rain. In the day when their keepers of the house shall tremble. I preached a message on this, I don't know, a year or two ago. Uh, the young and the old, I believe that is the name of it. Uh, verse 3, in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease. Uh, that's your teeth, we'll go over that, <laughs> you get older. Because they're few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened. Your vision gets darkened, we'll go over that. And the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low. Start losing your hearing. <clears throat> and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. You get up early in the morning. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high. You get older, you don't, you're scared of heights. Ain't this Bible put together, brother? Yeah. Amen. Verse 5. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way. You fear things you didn't fear 30, 40 years ago. And the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Verse 6, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken as at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth. You know what you and I are? We're dust. God made Adam out of the dust of the ground, Genesis 3. Rock group Kansas had a song I used to listen to before I got saved in the 70s. All we are is dust in the wind. Well, that might be true, but I'm glad God uses our, us as dust, and God blesses and saves us and will use us for his honor and glory. Yeah. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. So this message from Solomon is coming to a close in this 12th chapter. From the beginning of this book to this point, it's been quite a journey that began with gray, overcast skies of dreariness and gloom. Solomon was away from God and was focused on life under the sun, and you could read about all his riches and his 700 wives... <coughs> 700 wives and 300 concubines in 1 Kings chapters 10 and 11. Well, you can read about it in 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. But 1 Kings 10 and 11. It was a life without purpose and meaning because he left God out of the picture. He actually committed idolatry. I mean, David committed the sins of the flesh. He committed adultery. Solomon committed idolatry. I mean, at least David didn't go after other gods. So, uh, <clears throat> Solomon did. He went after other gods. They're named in 1 Kings 10 and 11. The gods are named. He married all these different foreign women and all that, and they, they took his heart away from the true and living God uh, of Israel, and they got him <coughs> serving other gods. <coughs> Don't get mad. That's the truth, what I just said. As we progress through the book, chapter by chapter, Rays of sunshine began to peek through the dark clouds as the king began to refocus his attention back on God. If you think about it, there would not have been a need for this book at all, Ecclesiastes, if the king Solomon had not forgotten the Lord earlier in his life. He knew better, but he forsook the wisdom God had given to him. Solomon had gotten away from God, and it affected his entire attitude and relationship with the Lord. It'll do that to you and I, too, and it'll cause you to drift away from the Lord. I've seen some real good Christian people who are serving God, on fire for God. I mean, they love God. They love church. They love the Bible. They love souls. Since I got saved in 1977, I've seen a bunch of them. And buddy, they started out, and they started out with a, 
I mean, they started out with a bang. And they went five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, maybe 25 years. And you can't find them today with the FBI, the CIA, a magnifying glass, the SWAT team, the KGB, and the ATF. And if you do find them, they don't want to hear anything about God. He got himself into trouble by breaking God's command and marrying many wives. Out of 700 wives, a number of them were foreign, idolatrous women who had great influence with Solomon. He loved these wives and ended up building temples in Israel to their pagan gods and also worshipped these idols. I mean, this man was blessed with more wisdom. Read about it. First Kings chapter 3. First Kings 3. You can read about that. That whole, that whole chapter. He asked God, and he didn't ask for riches or anything, but God made him the wealthiest, and he gave, more, he gave him more wisdom than anybody else. You can read about it. First Kings chapter 3. <clears throat> That's the danger of prosperity. The danger of prosperity is, is that you say goodbye to the Lord. The one who gave you that prosperity. His behavior was catastrophic for himself and the nation. The toll of sinful choices he made through the years affected him emotionally, physically, and spiritually. The spiritual and physical wounds from wine, women, wayward living, and the wickedness involved in idol worship left him with emptiness, with remorse, and regret. And he was honest about the way he felt here in Ecclesiastes. We read the verses. Solomon made a number of terrible choices and mistakes and were able to glean important lessons from those mistakes. This man who had forgotten God wanted us to learn from his burdens and the things that he did that weren't right. He messed up, so he shouted out here in this first verse to those who are young, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. The message is good for all of us, as well as young people. What does he mean by remember? It not only means to remember, but it carries other applications. Number one, concentration or attentiveness. The word remember has the idea of being attentive to the Lord, concentrating or focusing our thoughts on him. Isaiah heard the Lord ask, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And the prophet was attentive to the voice of God and responded with an obedient, available attitude. He said, here am I, send me. Isaiah 6, 8. That's the attitude that we're to have. Remembering the Lord is a call to action. What do you want, Lord? I'll do it. A concerned husband went to see the family doctor and he said, I think my wife is deaf. She never hears me the first time I say something. In fact, I often have to repeat things over and over again. Well, the doctor replied, go home tonight, stand about 15 feet from her, and say something. If she doesn't reply, move about 5 feet closer and say it again. Keep doing this so we can get an idea of the severity of of her deafness. Sure enough, the husband went home and he did exactly as the doctor ordered him. He stood about 15 feet from his wife, who stood in the kitchen chopping some vegetables. Honey, he said, what's for dinner? He got no response. So he moved about five feet closer and asked again, honey, what's for dinner? No reply. He moved five feet closer and still there was no reply. He got fed up and moved right behind her, about an inch away from her. And asked one final time, Honey, what's for dinner? And she replied, For the fourth time, vegetable stew. <laughs> <laughs> the, wife, the wife was speaking, but the husband wasn't here. Yeah. Now, I'm sure you ladies have done that, never had that problem with your husband. He hears everything you say. He doesn't have selective hearing. <laughs> just hear what he wants to hear. 
He did not realize the problem was with him. The Lord is speaking to us a lot of times, but the problem is we're not listening. We're not attentive to him. Number two, compliance or abide, abidance. We are to abide. We're, uh, we are to remember the Lord with the intention of obeying him. It's not enough just to remember the Lord, who he is and what he's done for us. We demonstrate our love and respect for him when we obey his commands. Uh, what are to be the ingredients of our obedience? Well, first of all, we're to obey enthusiastically, cheerfully, and willingly. <coughs> Isaiah 1.19 our, secondly, our obedience is to be energetic, devout, and fervent. Romans 12, 11. Obedience without fervency is like a sacrifice without fire. Obedience without fervency is like a sacrifice without fire. God deserves the best of our affections. Number three, our obedience is to be extensive, reaching to all his commands. A bunch of verses on that. Our, number four, our obedience is to be endless, consistent, and constant. Number five, our obedience is to encompass and embrace all of our hearts. Number six, it's to be our engagement, duty, and number one priority. Peter said we ought to obey God rather than men. After the American Civil War, General Lee, who was deeply loved by his soldiers, was one day riding in a country district when he was greeted by an old weather-beaten mountaineer. Ain't that General Lee? He inquired as he seized the horse's bridle. Yes, sir, said the general. Asking his old commander to dismount, which he did, the man stood before him and said, I'm one of your old soldiers, general. I want you just to let me give three rousing cheers from Mars Roberts. At the first shout, Lee dropped his head with embarrassment. The next yell was choked with sobs as the old soldier dropped on his knees in the dust, hugging Lee's leg. The third shout died away in tears of gratitude and love. If such devoted love were only given by every soldier of Jesus Christ to the Lord, how soon victory would be seen in our own lives and in the lives that we reach for Christ. He is our living leader and he will be to the end. Number three, control or alteration of one's life. When we remember the Lord, we allow him to influence our lives and be under the control of his spirit. We're to be yielded to him. His power enables us to change and become more like Christ every day. Are you yielded to Christ each day or do you find yourself resisting the Lord and fighting against him? Do you still dabble in the sinful activities of your past? I thought this was interesting. I'll close with this. When we look at the hummingbird and the vulture, the hummingbird and the vulture, we find that they teach important lessons to us that pertain to our walk with God. All that a vulture sees is rotting meat. Rotting meat. Because that is what this bird looks for daily. Vultures thrive on this kind of diet, but hummingbirds ignore the smelly flesh of dead animals. Instead, they look for the colorful blossoms of desert plants. The vultures live, watch this now, the vultures live on what was dead meat. They live on the past and in the past. They fill themselves with what is dead and gone. But hummingbirds live on what is present tense. They seek new life. They fill themselves with freshness and life. Each bird finds what it's looking for. We all do. Everybody in Hillsboro does. 
Everybody in America does. You say what? Finds what they're looking for. It just depends on what you're looking for. This brings us to some good questions. Do you have a vulture mentality that focuses on that which is in the past and stinks? Or do you have a hummingbird mentality that looks for what is beautiful, alive, wonderful, and going on now? Woo! Got to shout and run the aisles. We're to be yielded to the Lord. Paul said, Be not drunk with wine when it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him and bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. John 15.5 And also, whatever you do, we're to let the Lord use us to glorify him. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Whether therefore you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. <clears throat> 